Section 31 of Edward III by William Parsons Warburton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Fourth Decade. Chapter 3. Domestic Affairs. The narrative of a Spanish expedition has been dealt upon at some length, partly because the victory of Navarrete stands out prominently in the annals of English heroism, but chiefly because, to the secondary consequences of the campaign, as will presently be seen, is distinctly traceable the loss of all that England had gained in France by the Battle of Poitiers. But there were in the home history and domestic legislation of the decade, the external events of which we have just considered, many points of great interest and importance which cannot be passed over. A second outbreak of the plague occurred in the autumn of 1361, to which the illustrious Lancaster of the Rhine neck fell a victim. The years 1362 to 1363 were as fruitful in legislation as 1352, 25 Edward III, and witnessed the same minute and vexatious interference with trade which characterized the enactments of that year. There was hardly an article of ordinary consumption which escaped being meddled with by the parliaments of these two years. In the first place, as above stated, the staple or privileged market, for reasons which it is difficult to comprehend, much more to justify, was fixed at Calais. And peculiar commercial advantages and immunities were granted to that port, a number of articles being specified which could not be sent out of England except thither. The result of this was that during the three years which the statute remained unrepealed, the whole of the export trade of this country was compelled to pass through Calais. These regulations were founded on the vicious and self-destructive principle of directly enhancing revenue at the expense of commerce, but it is difficult to see how they could have conduced even to that object in any way beyond affording a greater facility and certainty in collecting duties, an advantage which would probably be more than counterbalanced by the diminution of traffic consequent upon the harassing restraints to which enterprise was thereby subjected. But indeed, export trade was reduced to a minimum by prohibitions and all but prohibitory burdens manufactured wools, the cloths called worsteds, from a village of that name in Norfolk, butter and cheese, and a host of other English productions were absolutely forbidden to be sent out of the country, to the great injury and discouragement of the producers of those articles, and with the avowed intention of keeping down prices. In September 1362, even wool and wool fells were forbidden to be exported, but in the following month the prohibition was removed. The reason for its removal was stated with remarkable candor, namely, that the king had regard to the great subsidy which the commons have granted him, now in this parliament, of wools, leather, and wool fells to be taken for three years. By ancient custom, the king's collectors levied half a mark from denizens and ten shillings from aliens, on every sack of wool and every three hundred wool fells. But the royal officers had learned from the results of the arbitrary imposition of the Maltolt how great an additional burden of taxation this commodity would bear, and at one critical time, that of the second French invasion, special duties were imposed amounting to the enormous amount of fifty shillings on the sack of three hundred and sixty-four pounds, the king could, in fact, by an understanding with the trade, increase at will the duty on wool. The merchants, securing the monopoly, were willing to pay the maltolt and recoup themselves out of the pocket of the consumer. The export of horses, hawks, plate, coin, and coal were forbidden or checked by prohibitory duties, and one restrictive ordinance of this date is of a remarkably comprehensive character, declaring that no wines, corn, beer, animals, whether flesh or fowl, horses, clergy, foreigners, or others, shall be allowed to pass out of the kingdom without special leave. The closest surveillance was exercised over the arrivals and departures. 
even traders on business from Scotland were obliged to secure a safe conduct. Merchant ships crossing the channel were compelled to be armed or provided with an escort. But a strange light is thrown on the insecure condition of the interior of the country by the fact that traders could not venture to travel through England with their wagons of merchandise, except in large bodies accompanied by a strong guard of armed men like the caravans in the desert. While the foreign trade was thus minutely regulated, business transactions at home were even more inquisitorially and despotically dealt with. It seems to have been a general principle of legislation in those days to endeavor to protect the buyer against the producer, and with this object to mark off sharply the distinctions between the different trades, the reason being given the great mischiefs that have happened of that the merchants called grocers do engross all manner of merchandise vendable, and suddenly do enhance the price of such merchandise within the realm, putting to sale by ordinance made betwixt them, called the fraternity and guild of merchants, the merchandises which be most dear, and keep in store the other, till the time that dearth or scarcity be of the same. It was therefore ordained, that all merchants should deal in one kind of merchandise only, and make up their minds, betwixt then and Candlemas, what this kind should be. No one should meddle with the mystery of fishmongers except those that belong to it. No one should use the mystery of drapers without being apprenticed to it. So with the dealers in wine, and the dealers in poultry, and as for the goldsmiths, it was specially enacted that no goldsmith making white vessel shall meddle with gilding, nor they that do gild shall meddle with white vessel. These measures would not have been complete without an attempt at the always unprofitable and hopeless task of regulating personal expenditure by law. We find it embodied in a statute of the Parliament of 1363, that the poor come to eat and drink in the manner that pertaineth to them and not excessively. No servant was to wear a suit of clothes costing more than two marks, or veils above twelve pence value. Shepherds and all manner of people attending to husbandry were not to wear any manner of cloth except blanket and russet wool of twelve pence a yard. It is a curious coincidence that just about this time Archbishop Islip addressed his famous remonstrance to King Edward on the abuses, and especially the foppery and the extravagance of the court, beginning, Domine mi rex utinam saperes, a document well worth study, as coming from a favorable quarter, and yet giving a picture of the king's government very different from the current traditions which represent him as the idolized ruler of a happy and contented nation. All this was the work of the Parliament of 1362 to 1363, but they seem to have had some misgivings as to the policy or the practicality of carrying out these regulations, for they recommend that the things agreed to should be put by ordinance and not by statute, in order that if there were anything to amend, it might be amended in the next Parliament. It is somewhat of a relief to find that in that next Parliament, many of the most oppressive and injudicious of these enactments were actually repealed, but it was not till 1365 that the staple was removed from Calais. It is somewhat remarkable that after the siege of that city we hear little or nothing more of firearms in the wars of this reign. The importance of archery was never more conspicuous than in the Battle of Navarrete, but it would seem from a letter of King Edward to the sheriffs of the counties in 1363 that there was a tendency among the people to a diminishing trust in this arm. Whereas, so runs the circular, the people of this country did commonly exercise themselves in the art of archery, whereas now, as if entirely putting aside the said art, the same people take to the throwing of stones, wood, and iron, and some to handball, football, stick-play, and to the fighting of dogs and cocks. It is to be proclaimed that every man in the country of able body on feast days shall use bows and arrows in his games, and give up those vain games under pain of imprisonment. 
Another memorable fact in the history of the memorable year 1362 was the parliamentary ordinance that the English, instead of the French language as heretofore, should be used in pleadings in the courts of law. In Statute 1, C. 15, 36 Edward III, the change is said to have become necessary because the French tongue is much unknown in England, so that the people which do implead or be impleaded in the king's court or in the courts of other have no knowledge or understanding of that which is said for them or against them by their sergeants or other pleaders. See below where some account is given of the way in which English became the national language. It must be borne in mind that at the date of this statute commanding the public forensic use of the English tongue, Wycliffe and Chaucer, the fathers of English prose and of English poetry, had already begun their task of creating an English literature. But of all the legislative measures of this period, the most notable was the statute of Kilkenny, passed at a parliament held in that town in the last year of the decade, in the Lent session of 1367. This famous or infamous enactment, gathered up into one and recapitulated with additional aggravations and insults, all the former oppressive, exasperating, and iniquitous ordinances by which English legislation for Ireland had hitherto been disgraced. In the reign of Edward II, the disaster of Bannockburn and the patent incapacity of the government had kindled expectations in the hearts of the Irish of uprooting forever the hated alien rule. But these hopes of national emancipation were disappointed, though under the brief reign of Edward Bruce, the area occupied by the English of the Pale was considerably contracted, and a large number of the Irish regained possession of their lands. Among the earliest measures passed in the reign of Edward III was a statute directed against absenteeism, obliging all Englishmen who were Irish proprietors either to reside on their estates or to provide soldiers to defend them. But this enactment was unproductive of good results. The O'Neills drove the colonists out of the liberty of Ulster, and the English de Burs, so far from helping to uphold English ascendancy, appropriated to themselves the entire lordship of Connaught, made common cause with the native tribes, and adopting their dress, language, and customs became Hibernus Ipsis Hiberniores, threw off their allegiance to King Edward, and bade defiance to the king's authority. Thus it came to pass that before many years of this reign had elapsed, more than a third part of the territories of the Pale were again in the hands of its original possessors. Had English statesmen contemplated only the alternatives of the enslavement, or of the extermination of the conquered inhabitants, had they on the one hand expected to be able to reduce them to the condition of helots, indifferent to freedom or incapable of resistance, or on the other hand, indulged the hope that the Irish would decay and disappear before the colonists, as savage aborigines melt away before a stronger race, their policy would indeed be explicable but the native race was endowed with far too much vitality for the latter fate, and with far too much pride, courage, elasticity, and genius for the former, and the half-measures which were adopted tended only to exasperate and not to coerce or overawe. Edward III inherited the barbarous and iniquitous traditions of English rule in Ireland, but he improved upon them. He ordered all his officers in that country who had Irish estates to be removed and give place to Englishmen with no Irish ties. He next declared void every grant of land in Ireland since the time of Edward II and made new grants of the lands thus recovered to the crown. The tendency of this monstrous measure was to create two more antagonistic parties in Ireland destined by their bitter dissensions to bring about the result that ere long all the king's land in ireland was on the point of passing away from the crown of england namely the english by blood as the established settlers were called and the english by birth or new grantees some of the chief of the former in despair of a career or even of a quiet life at home 
were about to bid goodbye to Ireland and seek their fortunes elsewhere, when they were arrested by a proclamation making it penal for any English subject capable of bearing arms to leave the country. In 1357 was passed the monstrous enactment already described, forbidding marriage and gossiprid between English and Irish. In 1359, Edward forbade the election of any mere Irish to the office of mayor, bailiff, or other civil post of authority. But the evils against which these statutes were directed continued to increase. The English by blood became more and more intimately connected and identified with the native Irish, and the English by birth became more and more powerless to maintain the English ascendancy, till at last in 1361, the king determined on sending over a viceroy of the blood royal and appointed to the post his son Lionel, created shortly afterwards Duke of Clarence, whom he had married to Elizabeth de Burr, daughter and representative of the last Earl of Ulster. But though Prince Lionel on his arrival took the precaution of forbidding any man born in Ireland to approach his camp, his position soon became so critical that the king issued writs commanding all the absentee Irish lords to hasten to Ireland to the assistance of the prince, for that his very dear son and his companions in Ireland were in imminent peril. The next step was the passing of the Statute of Kilkenny. It reenacted the prohibition of marriage and foster nursing, rendered obligatory the adoption of the English language and customs, forbade the national games of hurlings and coitings, and the use of the ancient Gaelic code called the Senkis Moor, a code by which the native Brahones or judges of the Irish Seps had decided causes among them since the time of the conversion of the race to Christianity in the fifth century. The English by birth were no longer to be called in derision English Hobbs, nor the English by blood Irish dogs. But the statute contained no prohibition of the expression mere Irish as applied to the Irish by birth and by blood. Reflecting on the long series of efforts made by the English to legislate for Ireland and the sum of their past and present results, one is tempted to parody in a reverse sense the well-known couplet of Goldsmith, reader's note, actually Samuel Johnson, and exclaim, How much of all that human hearts endure Kings and their laws can cause and cannot cure. End of section 31section 32 of edward the third by william parsons warburton this librivox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami fifth decade a d 1367 to 1377 chapter one from the end of the spanish campaign to king edward's last treaty with france part one the last decade saw King Edward III at the zenith of power and renown. His court was the most splendid in Europe. The vanquished and captured King of France was its permanent and honored guest rather than a prisoner. The King of Scotland was there, pleading for a reduction of his ransom, and a third crowned head, the King of Cyprus, had come from that distant outpost of Christendom to supplicate the aid of the foremost warrior of the faith against the encroachments of the infidel. Popular at home and dreaded abroad, he had obtained by force of arms and by the wise abandonment of his claim to the crown of France the full sovereignty over a third part of that kingdom, and had committed the safekeeping of this great dominion to his son, the terror of whose name was a better protection than a cordon of fortresses. His fleets rode the channel as triumphantly as his armies had marched over the soil of France. At home his royal revenue was doubled, and the condition of the people incalculably improved, and a sounder system of government and legislation, because resting on a wider and more popular basis, had been substituted for the thinly disguised and insecure despotism of his predecessors. Before the close of this fifth and last decade of the reign, all that was external of this splendid fabric of prosperity and power had crumbled into dust. In 
the best army that England could raise had all but perished of cold and hunger among the bleak hills of Auvergne. Her fleets were driven from the seas, her coasts ravaged and burned with impunity, the plague again broke out, the good queen was no more, the court had become a scene of intrigue, and the royal authority and character had been brought into contempt. Nothing remained of that brilliant forty years past except the silent upgrowth of liberty, constitutionalism, and equal rights, which the king and his counsellors had done their best to check as mischievous and undutiful encroachment. It is unnecessary to dwell long on the details of the history of this gloomy period, but some short account must be given of the successive strokes of misfortune which brought low the English dominion in France. The Spanish campaign was, in its immediate and remoter consequences, a fatal triumph for the English arms. The Black Prince, the hope of the future of the country, returned from Spain to Aquitaine a broken, and though he lingered for nine years, to all intents and purposes, a dying man. He took the field but once again, and that on an expedition which his biographer would gladly erase from the history of his life. In 1368, the debts which he had contracted, in reliance on the promises of the infamous Pedro, were so pressing that he had no choice but to, one, dismiss the companies half paid with a tacit promise to ravage French territory, and, two, to impose a war tax upon his newly acquired subjects. The tax selected was one of the most unfortunate and unpopular that could have been hit upon, for the French peasant was reminded of its burden every time he lighted his fire of sticks to cook his frugal meal. Each hearth was assessed to pay a duty of half a franc a year for five years. This impost was recommended to the prince by his chancellor, but was strongly disapproved of by many of his other advisers, and his tried old friend John of Chandos was so convinced of its impolicy and danger that on his warnings being disregarded, he withdrew to his domain in Normandy. Prince Edward had made an enemy of the Lord of Albret, one of the most powerful of the southern French barons, by dismissing as unnecessary five-sixths of the contingent of lances which that noble had brought with him to join the Spanish campaign. He and other disaffected lords whose domains skirted the Pyrenees determined to resist the tax, and in defiance of the Treaty of Bretigny, by which all rights over Aquitaine were forever ceded to England, they hastened to Paris and appealed to the King of France as their proper suzerain. It would seem to be impossible at this distance of time to attempt to assign to the English and to the French king each his due proportion of blame for the fatal non-execution of the renunciations agreed upon under the treaty. Edward was probably unwilling on his part to give up the claim to the crown of France, which had cost his country so dear, till the rest of the stipulations had been fulfilled, or due security given for their fulfillment. Whereas Charles soon found out that the inhabitants of the ceded districts were not very warm in their new allegiance, and he probably cherished the hope that before he tied his hands by the execution of formal renunciations, some occasion might arise to enable him to recover all that France had lost in his father's reign. Be this as it may, he listened with a ready ear to the grievances of the discontented nobles, but unwilling at once to expose his hand, he managed to amuse and detain them at his court under various pretexts for a whole year. At last, in the spring of 1369, he threw off his disguise and summoned the Prince of Wales to appear before him at his court of Paris to answer the complaint of his vassals. Surprise and indignation roused for a moment the old spirit in the failing prince. Gladly said he to the messenger, We will answer to our summons as the King of France has ordered us, but it will be with helm on head and with sixty thousand men. Until this time, Charles, wise with the serpent's wisdom, had kept up a show of friendship with the English court, and had so far succeeded as to make King Edward turn a deaf ear to the warnings which the prince 
repeatedly addressed to his father. The installments of King John's ransom were punctually paid, and the English king received a present of fifty pipes of wine from his brother of France, which it should be said, however, he immediately returned. Galeazzo Visconti, the ambitious lord of Milan, having married his son John to the daughter of the late king of France, now determined to ally himself to the royal house of England, and tempted Lionel, Duke of Clarence, then a widower, with the offer of a splendid dowry to take the hand of his daughter Violante. King Charles received the English prince at the court of Paris, with his enormous retinue, on his way to Italy, and feasted him royally for many days. These intimate and cordial relations were rudely interrupted by the news of the summons of the Prince of Wales to appear and answer for himself before the French king. Edward III, seriously alarmed at the turn things were taking, offered once more formally to renounce all claim to the French crown, on condition of being left in peaceable possession of his French territories. This proposal was laid before the peers of France, who advised their sovereign to reply to it by a declaration of war. King Edward had all along with his old and justifiable distrust of French courtesies been making active preparations for the defense of his continental as well as of his English territories, but on this occasion King Charles was beforehand with him. War was not declared till the French king's plans were ripe for execution, and the very day on which the kitchen scullion who carried the defiance to Edward set foot on English ground, Pontieux was entered, and occupied by French troops, who met with little opposition on the part of the garrisons, and none on that of the population. Shortly afterwards the whole of the English possessions in France were by authoritative sentence and proclamation declared to be annexed to the French crown. War was now inevitable, but in the meantime events had taken place in Spain which gave King Charles a powerful ally, of whose services he was not long in availing himself. When the Black Prince returned to Aquitaine and was safe on the French side of the Pyrenees, the ex-king, Henry of Trastamar, withdrew from his inroad into the duchy, and re-entered Spain at the head of nine thousand men that he had been enabled to draw to his standard by the assistance of the Duke of Anjou, the runaway hostage whom, it will be remembered, King Charles's brother had made lieutenant-general in Languedoc. Henry found that the continued cruelties of Pedro had already disposed the Castilians to welcome a rival claimant to the throne, and he had once gained easy possession of some of the principal cities, but was obliged to lay regular siege to Toledo, which still held out for the reigning king. Here he was joined by two thousand of the companies from Languedoc, and a large body of French adventurers in search of glory or spoil, under the command of Du Guesclin, who had again been ransomed from Sir John of Chandos for one hundred thousand francs. Henry soon found himself in a position to take the field against his half-brother, all except the Andalusians had deserted Pedro, but he was supported by twenty thousand men from that province, and did not scruple to associate with them twenty thousand Moors, whom he had procured from the king of Granada by means of his friendship with that monarch's vizier and chief astrologer, Benahatin. He was advancing with this formidable host to raise the siege of his faithful city of Toledo, when Henry, acting under the advice of Duguesclin, marched out to meet him, and the two armies fell in with each other by the castle of Montiel. Pedro's soldiers, who had no suspicion of the nearness of the enemy, were advancing in irregular groups, and Henry fell upon them in detail with his whole force, and put them to rout, before they had time to form in battle order or bring each other mutual assistance. The battle was long and bloody, for the Andalusians and the Moors had the advantage of numbers, and the soldiers of Henry, taking them all indiscriminately for accursed Jews and Mahometans, both sides maintained the struggle, with the ferocity engendered by antipathy of religion as well as of race. Pedro, to do him justice, fought this, his last fight, like a man, and held his ground till forced off the field by his still faithful friend, Fernando de Castro. Chapter 
and hurried for safety into the castle. At midnight he attempted to fly from the stronghold, but was seized and carried into a tent in Henry's camp, where the two brothers were shortly brought face to face. They flung themselves one upon the other with all the fury of mutual hatred. In the struggle, Pedro, being the stronger, got Henry down under him, and was in the act of giving him a vital stab, when Du Guesclin caught him by the leg and turned him over, and Henry, springing up, buried his dagger in his brother's heart. This hideous scene was the end of the civil war. Henry of Trastamar was once more proclaimed king, and he and his descendants for many generations ruled peaceably over the realm of Castile. End of section 32section thirty three of edward the third by william parsons warburton this librivox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami fifth decade chapter one from the end of the spanish campaign to king edward's last treaty with france part two but henry of trastamar could not forget the part which the prince of wales had taken against him during the siege of toledo he had entered into a treaty against England with the King of France, and was now prepared to give him active assistance in the war which was declared against England within a month of Henry's second accession. The English Parliament was sitting at the time of the arrival of the bearer of the French defiance, a kitchen boy, Varlet de Cuisine, selected to aggravate the insult of the challenge. As soon as it was ascertained that the letter was genuine, king lords and commons determined on immediate preparations for a vigorous resistance the parliament granted a liberal subsidy for war expenses and recommended that edward should again assume the title of king of france just as before the peace which charles son of john late king of france had broken from that time till the reign of george the third the french fleur-de-lis was quartered with the english leopards on our great seal the first attack on france was made through brittany its duke was now by express stipulation a vassal of the king of france but his heart always inclined toward the english alliance and though he had done homage to charles in thirteen sixty six in thirteen seventy two he had again entered into a treaty offensive and defensive with edward and he now welcomed the invaders of france on their disembarkation in his dominions Sir John Chandos returned to his duty when danger threatened. The Coptal de Bouche and Sir Hugh Calverley came at the call of the prince to the rendezvous at Angoulême, where he lay almost helpless from disease and devoured with vexation. Meantime, an expedition for the invasion of England was being fitted out in the northern ports of France, but the Duke of Lancaster, having occupied Calais with a strong force, the invasion was abandoned. The French fleet had only accomplished the burning of Portsmouth when it was recalled, and King Charles concentrated his soldiers at home, while the Duke was wasting and pillaging far and wide between Calais and the capital. A French force under the King's brother, Philip, Duke of Burgundy, largely outnumbering the English, advanced against them, but was withheld from engaging by orders from the king of france after confronting the invaders for some weeks the duke broke up his army and having lighted his watch-fires to deceive the enemy decamped under cover of night just as his grandfather king philip had done twenty years before on almost the same ground abandoning the citizens of calais to their fate the ensuing winter was made sadly memorable by the death in a chance melee of the gallant old john of chandos encountering a small body of the enemy at the foot of a bridge over the vienne sir john had dismounted for the ground was slippery with frost thinking to fight them better on foot his leg got entangled in the long robe of white samite which he wore under his armour and he fell upon his knee he had lost an eye hunting some five years before, and a nameless knight, coming upon his blind side, 
dealt him a mortal blow in the face under his unclosed visor. His loss was a fatal injury to the English cause in the long desultory warfare that now began and continued for years, with varying success on both sides. It is unnecessary to give the wearisome details. Suffice it to say that every year saw the English dominion more and more disintegrated, and fresh accessions made from it to the territory of France. The Duke of Lancaster, on whom the conduct of the war devolved, was gifted with no military capacity, and there is reason to suspect that he was even now not influenced by a jealousy of his illustrious brother, and a desire to take advantage of the enfeebled condition of that prince for his own aggrandizement. King Edward, with his concurrence and possibly at his suggestion, for he was witness to the order, commanded the black prince to remit the hearth tax and restore the money already paid. He also offered the royal pardon to those who had revolted against the English authority and sent the duke with a fresh commission into Aquitaine, nominally to reinforce his brother, but with ample powers of independent action. And now King Charles, believing that the time had come for striking a fatal blow, and having asked for and obtained a liberal subsidy from the States General, in 1370 organized a double and simultaneous invasion of the English territory to be led by his two brothers, the Duke of Anjou and the Duke of Berry. The first army under the real leadership of Du Guesclin, and reinforced by a large body of the companies, overran the Agenois, taking city after city, and advancing within a few miles of Bordeaux itself. The other entered the Limousin, and laid siege to its capital Limoges, which was surrendered to them by the treachery of its governor, the bishop. Sir Robert Knowles, meanwhile, landed at Calais with five thousand men, and ravaged the north of France, sparing only the cities which were willing to pay him blackmail. He could find no enemy to match him in the field, and advanced so far as even to threaten the city of Paris, from the ramparts of which the citizens could see the farms and villages blazing. Knowles had risen into notice as a captain of brigands, but was now in the pay of the English king, and is claimed as one of the ancient worthies of the county of Chester. In despite of their power, says Fuller, he drove the French people before him like sheep, destroying towns, castles, and cities in such manner and number that many years after the sharp points and gable ends of overthrown houses, cloven asunder with instruments of war, were commonly called Knolls, his mitres. Du Guesclin was summoned from the south to defend the capital, but Knowles, whose followers became unruly and mutinous after a slight reverse, withdrew into Brittany before his arrival. The Prince of Wales, for some unexplained reason, was beside himself with fury at the surrender of Limoges, and swore by the soul of his father that he would recover the city. He was carried in a litter, for he could no longer ride, up to the walls, and finding the place too well fortified and garrisoned for a successful assault, sat down before it to take it by siege, and his engineers mined the walls night and day. At the end of a month the mine was completed and the walls stood supported only upon wooden props with which the miners had shorted up as they worked. Fire was now set to the props, the workmen withdrew, and at the hour of prime as fixed by the prince, down crashed a great pane of the wall, leveling up the ditch, and leaving a breach through which the English poured in before the garrison had recovered from the stupor of the shock. Inflamed with revengeful passion and triumph, the prince rode in high, mounted on his litter with his guards and partisans on foot, and deliberately ordered his soldiers to dash out with their pole-axes the brains of all they met, and show no mercy to man, woman, or child. A guard of archers was posted at the breach, and another at the gate, to slay the fugitives. Surely at such a time, says Barnes, war is dressed up in his most dreadful habiliments, and that heart must be very strongly barred against all access of pity 
which would not relent at the sight when men, women, and children, with hands and eyes lifted, flung themselves on their knees before the enraged prince to entreat for mercy. This was the last military exploit of the victor of Poitiers, and one too many for his fair fame. But even then, though mercy was extinct, the class feeling of chivalry survived. Three French knights, seeing that all was over, resolved at least to sell their lives as dearly as they could, planted their backs to a wall, and with eighty stout men-at-arms beside them, and their banners displayed, awaited the onslaught of the English. The men-at-arms were soon beaten down and slain by overwhelming numbers, but those three knights still stood at bay, and the Duke of Lancaster and the Earls of Cambridge and of Pembroke each singled out and attacked one of them, while the slayers paused from the work of destruction to gaze on the triple duel. The Black Prince was passing in his litter, and his vindictive rage gave way as he saw how gallantly his brothers and the Frenchmen fought, and so for the sake of these three valiant gentlemen he commanded that the slaughter should cease, and took them and the survivors to mercy. The traitorous bishop, the author of the whole calamity, was also spared at the urgent entreaty of Pope Urban V. But three thousand of the innocent plebeian townsfolk were massacred, and the city reduced to ashes. In 1371, the prince, on returning from the sack of Limoges, became rapidly so much worse that his physicians peremptorily ordered his immediate departure for England. So urgent were they that he left the body of his eldest son, Edward, who died at this juncture, to be buried by the Duke of Lancaster, now appointed his successor in the government of Aquitaine. But the duchy was fast slipping out of English hands, and that it was so is an indication of something more than want of military capacity in the English leaders, or the superiority of French tactics. Charles was wise enough to see and take advantage of the change of feeling that had come over the inhabitants themselves. The newly annexed districts hardly disguised the reluctance with which they submitted to the English rule, and even the provinces which had never been separated from the English dominion began to feel that they belonged by natural right to France, and to turn their eyes toward Paris as the proper centre of their national life. The time was long past for Aquitaine to glory as it once did, in its independence of the king who reigned in Paris, and the existence of a foreign principality within the geographical limits of France was doomed from the moment that it became an anachronism, that is to say, a fact out of keeping with the times. But though the Black Prince was, as a soldier, as good as dead, and the king himself enfeebled in mind and body, the English people had no intention of submitting to a dismemberment of the monarchy, and unanimously determined on a new invasion of France. Fatal errors had meantime been committed. The King of Navarre and Robert II of Scotland had been suffered to ally themselves with the French in 1370. This Robert, the nephew of David II, who died in 1371, was the first crowned king of the family of the hereditary stewards of Scotland, a title which, under the later form of Stuart, gave a name to our royal English dynasty, the lineal descendants of Robert II. About the same time, an untoward concurrence of circumstances confirmed the hostility of the new king of Castile and made him a bitter as well as a dangerous enemy to England. King Pedro's daughters had been allowed to rejoin their father, and upon his death they fled for refuge to Bayonne in English territory. In 1372, John of Gaunt, having lost his wife, who brought him the title of Lancaster, was advised by the Gascon nobles to marry Constance, the eldest daughter. My lord, they said, you are marriageable, and we know of a great marriage whereby you and your heirs will be kings of Castile, and it is a great charity to comfort and advise young girls, especially the daughters of a king. Take the eldest in marriage, we advise you. The duke listened to their suggestion, and he and his brother, the Earl of Cambridge, married the two orphan sisters. The duke, assuming the title of King of Castile, 
the reigning sovereign had no choice but to repel the pretension by all means in his power and an opportunity of aggression was not long wanting to his hands king edward and his council having determined to invade france by way of rochelle the command of the expedition was given to the earl of pembroke and the king was so ill-advised as to send a small force of soldiers but plenty of money to pay the troops who he was assured would flock to his standard in poitou this money as will be seen was chiefly raised on the property of the church and to this fact the superstitious attributed the disastrous result of the expedition at the french king's entreaty henry of trastamar sent a spanish fleet to rochelle to oppose the disembarkation of the invading forces the english were in possession of the castle and nominally of the town of rochelle but in no part of the french territory ceded under the treaty of bretigny was the ill will of the inhabitants toward their new masters more strongly felt when pembroke arrived with his little fleet off rochelle he found forty great castellated spanish neefs and other vessels drawn up to receive him the english at once attacked them and fought so valiantly that when night separated the combatants the battle was undecided the governor of the place labored hard to persuade the townsmen to embark and help the english but they pleaded that though they would gladly fight on land they were no sailors next morning at high tide the spaniards having the wind in their favor each of their ships deliberately singled out and grappled an english vessel and pouring down stones lead and bars of iron from the tops upon the decks of the enemy sent it and its crew to the bottom before the english could climb the steep sides of the spanish neef pembroke himself was taken prisoner the treasure ship sunk the whole of the english fleet captured or destroyed and a blow thus inflicted on england's naval power from which it took many a long day to recover End of section thirty three section thirty four of edward the third by william parsons warburton this librivox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami fifth decade chapter one from the end of the spanish campaign to king edward's last treaty with france part three but the war still lingered on with varying success bertrand du guesclin now constable of france was the commander-in-chief of the french land forces and he was ably seconded by owen of wales a famous sea captain of whom many brilliant exploits are recorded among others the capture of the Captal de bouche the last soldier of mark on the english side rochelle was taken by stratagem poitiers by treachery soubise saint jean d'angele and saint surrendered and tuart and bordeaux were now the only cities of importance left to the english in aquitaine tuart was already invested by the french and thither came the constable du guesclin with seven thousand men to reinforce the besiegers the barons friendly to england shut up in tuart sent word to king edward that they had agreed to capitulate if not relieved by september twenty ninth the king made a last effort to fling off his growing lethargy and proclaimed that he would invade france himself with his three sons at the head of his army and the poor shattered prince of wales declared that though he died on the way he should not be left behind on august thirtieth the expedition sailed from sandwich four hundred ships carrying ten thousand bowmen and four thousand lances but it was destined never to reach the french shore five weeks they beat in vain against contrary winds and september twenty ninth found them still tossing on the waves of the channel god was for the king of france the people said for no sooner had the baffled expedition disembarked than the wind changed to a favourable quarter it is said to have lost nine hundred thousand pounds to our of course surrendered and the french cruisers again crossed the sea and pillaged the english coast and again set fire to portsmouth the next year brought fresh disasters 
but the decisive failure of the whole war was the last great expedition under the Duke of Lancaster in the autumn of 1373. One of the chief sufferers by the successes of the French was the Duke of Brittany, who had throughout faithfully, if disloyally, supported the English cause. Du Guesclin had, by King Charles's orders, invaded Brittany and reduced almost all the strongholds in the duchy, including the fortresses of Bretagne Bretonante, or Western Brittany, which had never before been occupied by royal troops. The duke, who had been expelled from France in 1373, now earnestly entreated the king of England, his father-in-law, to make one final effort for the recovery of the transmarine territories which he had lost. An expedition was planned on a scale of great magnificence. A splendidly equipped army left the English shores, accompanied by the Duke of Brittany and a brilliant array of English barons and knights, and was reinforced on its arrival at Calais by mercenaries from Aino, Flanders, and Brabant. They marched into France in three great battles, overrunning and wasting Artois, Picardy, the Vermandois, Champagne, Berry, and Limousin. The constable and the royal dukes of France were in force at Troyes, but they had orders to watch only, and not to attempt to resist the invaders. Let them go, ran the king's instructions. By burnings they will not come to your heritage. Though a storm and tempest rage together over a land, they disperse themselves. So will it be with these English. The latter were now approaching a very different country from the Vermandois, or the borders of the noble river Marne, where the terrified peasantry supplied them with food and forage from their fertile lands, and here they had often to go for a week without bread. Flying detachments of the French had from the time the expedition started from Calais been hanging on their flanks, cutting off foragers and stragglers, but always avoiding a collision with the main body. These pitiless pursuers now amounted to three thousand men, as, with winter coming on, the half-famished English columns entered the sterile and shelterless mountains of Auvergne, where they soon began to suffer the extremities of famine. Their horses were dying of starvation, and out of thirty thousand which they had brought with them, but a very few were now alive. As for the men themselves, it was a miserable sight, says Walsingham, to see famous and noble soldiers, once delicate and rich in England, without their men or their horses, begging their bread from door to door. Nor was there one who would give it them. At last a few spectral fugitives, out of the proud army which had marched from Calais, found shelter within the walls of Bordeaux. Though this was not the last effort made by England, it was the last which may be called national. Fighting continued to be carried on in Brittany, and reinforcements were sent there from time to time, but with no important results. Pope Gregory XI, ever since his accession in 1370, had used his honest endeavors to bring about a peace, but in those earlier days the humiliations of England and the successes of France were both too incomplete to dispose their sovereigns to accept his offers of mediation. Now, however, England was glad enough to send ambassadors to meet the papal nunchos at Bruges, and after long delays and difficulties on the part of the French, a truce was finally agreed upon to continue till the last day of June 1376. In the beginning of that year it was again prolonged, but it expired before the death of Edward III and his successor found himself compelled, among the first acts of his reign, to provide for the defense of the southern coast of England against the united fleets of France and Spain. We have already seen how the great north-central kingdom of Spain, delivered from civil strife and foreign intervention, was now peacefully governed by King Henry of Trastamar. The rest of the peninsula had been but slightly affected by the great events of the epoch of Edward III. But it remains to add a few words 
on the external and internal condition of France at the end of the first half of the Hundred Years' War. During the fifth decade of Edward's reign, the destinies of that kingdom had been in the hands of a prince of no ordinary capacity. It is true that nothing could have seemed more unpromising than his earlier essays at government. He had shown himself selfish, treacherous, and vindictive, a reckless, indifferent spectator of the miseries of his country, and had done his best to thwart the patriotic efforts of those who might then have saved France by reforming the abuses of her administration and reawakening her national energies. But Charles V had already lived long enough to earn and deserve the epithet of the wise, and indeed to accomplish himself, though at a terrible cost of suffering to his country, most of the great and beneficent objects for which Marcel had sacrificed his noble life in vain. He had lived to see repaired many of the disasters of the first two Valois reigns, to see the foreigner checked in Brittany and thrust out of Aquitaine. Europe, pitying the miseries and humiliations of France, had come to sympathize with her ruler in his patient and determined efforts for her restoration to her place among the nations, and the warlike achievements of Du Guesclin had done something toward restoring her military prestige. Foissart, at the time of the latest revision of his work, had transferred his literary allegiance from the unsuccessful to the successful camp, and become thoroughly French in tone and sympathies, but seeing, according to his wont, only the external forms and colors of history, he, like the bulk of his contemporaries, altogether failed to comprehend how such great results could be brought about by a king who never buckled on a cuirass, and rarely made a public appearance, a mere thinker, a mysterious recluse, who lived shut up in his Hôtel de Saint-Paul with his physicians, jurists, architects, and astrologers. Charles V, and he alone, restored national independence to France, but it was at the cost of civil freedom. The expenses of the war, the enormous ransoms of the prisoners, the stoppage of industry, had all but beggared the government and the people, and the king was not even then withheld by the emptiness of his exchequer from undertaking public works and costly buildings. He completed the fortifications of Paris begun by Marcel, erected churches, bridges, and fortresses, and among them the Bastille of gloomy memory, not indeed as a prison, but in order to keep the citizens of Paris in check. To meet the difficulties arising from the want of money, Charles, who since 1369 had governed without a parliament, found himself obliged to impose very heavy taxes on all commodities and especially upon labor. Each family was compelled to purchase every three months from the royal stores a quantity of salt, calculated according to their supposed wants by the officers of the excise, and the fines under this impost were applied to paying the salaries of the public functionaries, a fruitful source of corruption and tyranny. Twelve deniers were levied on each pound of provisions sold, and this tax was farmed by the creatures of the crown. Fuel was taxed at the rate of six francs a year per fire in the towns and two francs per fire in the country. An enormous impost, for it will be remembered that a hearth tax of half a franc had been made the pretext for the revolt of Aquitaine. Step by step these extraordinary were converted into ordinary and permanent aids, and royal collectors were in every case substituted for officers chosen as heretofore by the taxpayers themselves. The only consolation the people had was that the king's hand, if heavy, was strong, and the stern irresistible regularity of the administration no doubt assisted them to bear burdens under which they would otherwise have succumbed or broken out into open rebellion. In a word, France under Charles V had passed through a terrible agony. It is true that at the close of his reign in 1380, her government was powerful and respected, 
her foreign enemies had been humiliated or expelled from her shores her coinage and with it her credit had been restored and most of the disasters of preceding reigns were already repaired or in a fair way to reparation but for all this she had paid a heavy price in submitting to the establishment of an administrative and fiscal despotism from which she has never since under any changes of government been wholly emancipated end of section thirty four section thirty five of edward the third by william parsons warburton this librivox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami fifth decade chapter two internal affairs of england till the death of the king part one one turns with a sense of relief from the ineffectual and inglorious efforts made by england to recover her lost position abroad to the parliamentary history of a decade which though overshadowed by the influence of external disasters was fruitful in wholesome legislation and marked by the steady growth of constitutional principles the first parliament of importance after that of thirteen sixty nine which had advised edward to resume the title of king of france was held at westminster in the spring of thirteen seventy one the customary opening speech was made on this occasion by william of wickham bishop of winchester and then lord chancellor of england the last of a long unbroken succession of ecclesiastical chancellors for one of the earliest acts of this parliament was to present a petition praying that whereas the government of the kingdom had long been carried on by men of holy church who are not justiciable in all cases from which great mischiefs and damages have come in times past and more may happen in time to come therefore laymen being able and sufficient none others shall be made chancellors barons of the exchequer or shall be appointed to other great offices of state for the future the leader in this anti-clerical movement was the earl of pembroke the king's son-in-law afterwards taken prisoner at rochelle that the demand for the exclusion of ecclesiastics was peremptorily urged and strongly backed by the opinion of the majority is evidenced by the fact that it was immediately complied with and sir richard lescroop was appointed treasurer in the place of the bishop of exeter and sir robert thorpe lord chancellor to supersede the bishop of winchester though that prelate stood at the time higher than any other subject in the favour and confidence of the king this measure was shortly afterwards reversed and ecclesiastical chancellors continued to be appointed up to the sixteenth century but its temporary adoption by parliament enables us to measure the change which had taken place in the relative strength of the constituents of that assembly and in its bearing with respect to the king and his ministers but other influences from an opposite quarter contributed to its success while the independence and authority of the commons were advancing with rapid strides a powerful party with a reactionary tendency toward feudalism had made its appearance at the head of which was john duke of lancaster to whose hereditary pride the professional arrogance of the bishops and their monopoly of political and court influence were alike intolerable the sequel would seem to show that we should be in error in attributing statesmanlike or patriotic views to this prince but he had the good fortune to enlist on his side the great john wycliffe who was now beginning the work of his life the emancipation of his country from ecclesiastical tyranny one object they certainly had in common the apostolic poverty of the clergy wycliffe's position which he here took up and vigorously maintained to the end was this neither prelates nor doctors priests or deacons should hold secular offices but now said he benefices instead of being bestowed on poor clerks are heaped on a kitchen clerk or one wise in building castles or in worldly business a manifest allusion to the skill in architecture to which the late chancellor william of wickham bishop of winchester 
originally owed his advancement. Immediately on the appointment of that prelate's successor, a petition was presented with reference to the inefficiency of the navy, the condition of which was a source of great anxiety to this Parliament and to those of the two following years, in the first of which it was reduced almost to extinction by the disaster at Rochelle. The Assembly had no intention of mincing matters and at once laid the cause of the decline of the navy plainly before the king. They represented that in consequence of the withdrawal of the franchises of many seaports, they were ruined and uninhabited, and the shipping nearly annihilated, that merchants were so interfered with in their affairs by various ordinances of the king that they had no employment for their ships, and consequently hauled them up on the shore to rot, that the masters of the king's ships impressed and took the ablest seamen of other vessels, which were thus left without persons to manage them, so that many of them were lost and their owners ruined. It will be seen from this language that little distinction was thought of between the mercantile and naval marine, and that the efficiency of the one was supposed to stand or fall with that of the other. In the next Parliament, the following petition was presented. Also pray the commons, as merchants and mariners of England, that whereas twenty years since and at all times before, the navy of the kingdom was in all ports and towns on the seas and rivers, so noble and so plentiful, that all countries deemed and called our lord the king of the sea. And now, that it is so decreased and destroyed by different causes, that in case of need there remains hardly enough to defend the country. We thereby pray, as a work of charity, a suitable remedy. Edward answered evasively, as was sometimes his wont, that it was the king's pleasure that the navy should be maintained and kept with the greatest ease and profit that could be. But a subsidy of no less than fifty thousand pounds had already been granted for the reorganization and maintenance of the fleet and the other defenses of the country. The prosperity of the nation and its financial resources had fallen to a very low ebb at the commencement of this last decade of the reign. Wheat had gone up 100% and stood at a famine price in the year 1369-70. Amidst the universal depression and distress, the church alone was wealthy and flourishing and had in fact received, during the last seventy-five years, large accessions of landed property illegally, because in violation of the statute of Mortmain, passed in the reign of Edward I. The Parliament, following up its first victory over the Church, determined that the money now voted should be raised by a levy of twenty-two shillings threepence on every parish of the kingdom, and that the tax should be taken on all lands which, since the eighteenth year of Edward I, had passed into Mortmain. Now Mortmain, or dead hand, was an expression used with reference to the property of corporations, which yielded no personal feudal services, was held in perpetual succession, and hitherto exempted from ordinary taxation. The intention of the last clause will therefore be clearly understood if we bear in mind that not only each monastery and chapter, but each bishop and rector was in himself a corporation. The parochial estimate was of course founded on the supposition that the number of the parishes was about 45,000, the figures in fact given by Higdon in his Polychronicon, and the enormous miscalculation here made in a statistical return of national importance, and apparently of such easy verification, must be taken as a warning to receive with caution all the recorded statistics of these times, and especially those having reference to the amount of the revenues of the Church. When steps were taken to give effect to the order of Parliament, it was found that the parishes were not one-fifth of the number supposed, and the tax had to be increased to 116 shillings per parish in order to produce the required sum. The Parliament held in 1376, after an unusual interval of three years, was characterized by such important, well-intentioned, and upon the whole beneficial legislation, that it afterwards went by the name of the Good Parliament. 
In order to understand its proceedings, it is necessary to bear in mind that the king, though but sixty-four years old, was now prematurely senile and enfeebled. He had lost five years before his good, wise, and devoted Queen Philippa, and since her death had yielded himself more and more to the influence of Alice Perez, a married woman of great wit and beauty who had been lady of the bedchamber to the late queen. Through her means the Duke of Lancaster had contrived in the king's incapacity to attend to business, so completely to appropriate to himself the royal authority that he exercised an almost despotic influence in the administration and appointed all his own creatures to the great offices of state. In Parliament he led a strong party, whose avowed object was the aggrandizement of the aristocratical element and the curtailment of the privileges already won by the representatives of the people. To this latter, the popular party, which must also be called that of the opposition, the Prince of Wales lent his name and influence, and how powerful these were may be inferred from the immediate reversal, on his death, of many of the salutary measures which the commons had been enabled by his aid to pass. For the moment, the duke's designs were checkmated. He feared, says the unknown author of a spirited though one-sided contemporary chronicle, he feared the majesty of the prince, whom he knew to favor the knights. But when the prince died, he abused the king's simplicity, and the prince being dead, the effect of the parliament died with him. Sir Peter de la Mer was chosen vant parleur or speaker, for the commons were determined to have none of the creatures of the king or the duke, and he, trusting to God and standing together with his followers before the nobles, whereof the chief was John, Duke of Lancaster, whose doings were always contrary, declared that though the taxes had been heavy on the commons, now paying fifteenth, otherwise ninths and tenths, they would take in good part nor grieve about it if it had been bestowed upon the king's wars, though scarcely prosperous. But it was evident that neither the king nor the realm had any profit thereby, and the commons therefore demanded an open account of income and expenditure. After this, continues the chronicler, the judges not having wherewith to answer held their peace. But when the duke heard of the proceedings of the commons, he thought at first to put them down by bluster, what, cried he, do these base and ignoble knights attempt? Do they think they be kings or princes of the land? I deem they know not what power I be of. I will therefore in the morning appear unto them so glorious, and will show such power among them, and with such vigor will I terrify them, that neither they nor theirs shall dare henceforth to provoke me to wrath. But his private men reminded him that, he knew what helpers these knights had to undershore them, for that they have the favor and love of the lords, and especially the Lord Edward Prince, your brother, who giveth them his counsel and aid effectually. But what at last silenced him and brought him to reason was a warning of which he soon after felt the force, that the Londoners were against him and with the knights, and that if the commons were molested or interfered with, the people of the city would attempt all extremity against him and his friends. End of section 35。section 36 of Edward the Third by William Parsons Warburton。this LibriVox recording is in the public domain。read by Pamela Nagami。fifth decade。chapter two。Internal Affairs of England Till the Death of the King, Part Two. The Commons then proceeded with the work of the session. They petitioned that whereas, considering the evils of the country through so many wars and other causes, the officers now in the King's service are insufficient for so great a charge, the Royal Council should be strengthened by the addition thereto of ten or twelve bishops, lords, and others to be constantly at hand, and seeing that the king had been, by the private advantage of some nearer his person, 
and others by their collusion, so impoverished that he had been compelled to charge the commons with subsidy and tallage, notwithstanding the great ransoms of the French and Scotch kings and other prisoners, they therefore prayed him that he would do speedy justice on such as should be found guilty of misappropriating public money. Richard Lyons, a merchant of London and one of the council, was first arraigned. He, fearing his own skin, tried to win over the Prince of Wales by sending him by the river a present of one thousand pounds and a cask, as if it had been a barrel of sturgeon. But the bribe was sent back as it came, and Lyons convicted and sentenced to be imprisoned during the king's pleasure. Lord Latimer was condemned for collusion with Lyons, and the surrender for bribes of fortresses in Brittany. Several others were similarly impeached and convicted. But the last and most obnoxious offender was Alice Perez, against whom a special ordinance was directed, which the helpless king was compelled by his now imperious commons to sign. She had been made an object of public jealousy and dislike by the king's presenting her with the jewels of the late queen, and permitting her to ride through London on a white horse attired as the Lady of the Sun, followed by a great retinue of lords and ladies. But the charges now brought against her were of a more serious character. It was stated and proved that she constantly interfered with the due administration of justice, sitting on the bench with the judges, and defending and maintaining false causes everywhere by unlawful means, to get possessions for her own use. And if in any place she was resisted, she went unto the king by whose power being presently helped, whether it was right or wrong, she had her desire. The king therefore ordained that no woman shall do so hereafter, and in particular Alice Perez, under penalty of forfeiting all that Alice Perez can forfeit, and of being banished out of the realm. Edward, Prince of Aquitaine and Wales, had been summoned by these titles to the first Parliament which met after his return from France. He seems, however, to have taken little part in politics before the session of 1376. But in this first great constitutional struggle, in which the commons fairly measured their strength against the feudal nobles, the prince himself, the mirror and type of feudal chivalry, had descended from his vantage ground of birth and privilege, had taken the lead in the noble endeavor to sweep away the abuses and corruptions which had well-nigh ruined his country, and had been repaid by the most unbounded and enthusiastic affection on the part of the people. The work of this portion of his life is, beyond all question, his noblest title to fame, though he has been and probably always will be remembered, not as the leader of the first great popular movement of reform within the walls of Parliament, but as the hero of Crecy and Poitiers. The beneficent influence which he exercised is brought out in strong contrast by the reaction of the following session, when the Duke of Lancaster recovered his predominance on the prince's death. This event took place in his forty-sixth year at the Palace of Westminster, to which he had removed in order to be at hand when Parliament was sitting. He was buried in Canterbury Cathedral, where his mailed effigy may still be seen, with the royal fleur-de-lis of France carved on the surcoat of his armour. The Duke of Lancaster has not escaped suspicion of an intention to supplant Prince Richard, now heir apparent to the throne. Richard was at this time but ten years old, and the only surviving son of the Black Prince. It is said by the anonymous chronicler who has been so frequently quoted, that the Duke, coming in with his malefactors among the knights in Parliament assembled, earnestly desired them that they, associated with the lords and barons, would deliberate who, after the death of the king and the prince's son, ought to inherit the realm of England, and requested that after the example of France they would make a law that no woman should be heir to the kingdom, for he considered the old age of the king, whom death expected in the gates, and the youth of the prince's son, and etc. Had this proposal been adopted, 
the duke by the exclusion of the female offspring of his elder brother Lionel, who died without male issue in 1368, would have stood next in succession to Prince Richard. And the chronicler probably only expresses the feeling of the time when he hints that the life of that young prince would not have stood long in the way. But his ambition to be the first of a royal dynasty was not destined to be gratified, though by a singular irony of events, within a few months of his own death, his son was seated upon Richard's throne. The commons not only refused to entertain his request, but took the significant step of requesting that the boy prince should be presented to Parliament, in order that the lords and commons might see and honour him as the heir apparent to the crown. At Christmas 1377, King Edward formally invested his grandson his successor. Of the other matters which occupied the attention of the good Parliament, many were curious or interesting. They petitioned, it must be remembered that petition was then the basis of all legislation, that parliaments should, for the correction of errors and falsities, be held annually, that those persons who put on new taxes by their domain authority, thereby accroaching to themselves royal power, should suffer judgment of life members or forfeiture. Domain authority being that which the lords of manors exercised over the serfs or villains, their tenants at will. This petition shows that the ancient right or power of taxing this class which the lord undoubtedly possessed or exercised was now openly challenged, and regarded as an abuse to be rectified by appeal to Parliament. They further prayed that whereas the priories alien were filled with Frenchmen, who acted the part of spies, all Frenchmen should, while the war lasted, be banished the kingdom. The city of London represented that their ancient franchises were invaded by the residents of foreign brokers in the city. The king answered that if they would put the city under good government, no foreigners should be allowed to act as brokers or sell by retail in London and its suburbs, save his old friends in need, the merchants of the Hanseatic League. Other petitions had reference to the obstructions of the navigation of the Thames and the preservation of the fishery. No less than twelve were directed against the encroachments of the Pope and the drain of English money by his court and his creatures. It was asserted that the taxes raised by the Pope in England amounted to five times the amount of those levied by the king. Aliens living in the sinful city of Avignon held and farmed out English preferments. Aliens who have never seen and never will see their parishes, by which bad Christians, holy church is more destroyed than by all the Jews and Saracens of the world. God gave his sheep to be tended, not to be shaven and shorn. But the good Parliament was no better than its predecessors in abstaining from mischievous interference with trade and contract. The export of woolen yarns for manufacture in Normandy and Lombardy was prohibited, and the cruel and impolitic statute of laborers reenacted with additional aggravations. End of section 36. Section 37 of Edward III by William Parsons Warburton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Fifth Decade, Chapter 3 From the Death of the Black Prince to the Death of King Edward III. The patriotic hopes of the nation collapsed with the death of the Black Prince. The king, broken down in spirits and worn out before his time by ambitious excitement, affliction, and failure, had become a mere puppet of contending factions. The Duke of Lancaster resumed the virtual government of the country and retained it until the king's death, and his baneful influence may be traced in the rejection of many of the most reasonable and just of the later petitions of the commons. He sent the Speaker of the Good Parliament to prison, released Lyons and the other lesser culprits, and permitted the worthless Alice Perez to regain her place in the king's intimacy. <laughs> 
William of Wickham was obnoxious to the Duke, partly as a bishop, partly because the Black Prince had regarded him with special affection and singular delight, and partly because of the popular part which he had taken in the last Parliament. But he, if any, might have seemed safe out of the reach of the Duke's vindictiveness. He was a man of blameless life, so blameless that one of his contemporaries said that his enemies in attacking him were trying to find a knot in a rush. He was of humble origin and had risen by his own merits. But there was some ground for Wycliffe's innuendo that he owed his advancement in the church to his architectural skill, for though born in 1324, he is known only as surveyor of the king's works at Windsor till his ordination, which is believed to have taken place shortly before his first ecclesiastical preferment in 1357. From this date he becomes a prominent figure in the history of his time. He witnessed the ratification of the Treaty of Bretigny, became chief of the Privy Council, and in 1366 Bishop of Winchester and Chancellor of England. The charges now brought against him could not be seriously entertained, but the Duke was sufficiently powerful to procure his deprival of his temporalities or revenues of office and banishment from within twenty miles of the court. But though dismissed from the chancellorship, and thus aggrieved and humiliated, the great bishop lost nothing, even for the time, of his popularity and moral influence, and was pardoned and reinstated at the commencement of the next reign. To that reign the rest of his history belongs, and with it his great foundations of New College at Oxford and of the first public school at Winchester, an institution which has held its place in the vanguard of progress for five hundred years, and contributed perhaps more than any of its younger rivals to smooth the steep and rugged pathway by which poverty must climb the heights of knowledge and distinction. A churchman of a very different stamp was the Duke's friend and supporter John Wycliffe. Though something very like accident, as has been already stated, had associated the grave, ascetic, and high-souled doctor with the narrow-minded, vicious and self-seeking feudal aristocrat, Wycliffe was not born and never could have become a courtier, and circumstances made him for the greater part of his life a wrestler with principalities and powers. One idea they certainly had in common, that the impoverishment of the clergy would be a good thing. Much obscurity hangs over Wycliffe's early history and circumstances, his birthplace and the date of his birth are both uncertain. We hear of no father or mother, brother, sister, or wife. Tradition indeed tells us that he was born at Wycliffe, Cliff, the cliff of the River Swale, near Richmond in Yorkshire, that he was, in 1348, a student at Oxford, a well-known figure walking barefoot in a long gown of red serge, and that he wrote The Last Age of the Church, under the impressions produced on his mind by the Black Death, which began its ravages in that year. The most recent researches, which seem to establish the facts of his identity with the Wycliffe, who was fellow of Merton in 1356, hitherto held, on the authority of Dr. Shirley, to have been a different person, and of his having been not only master or warden of Balliol College and rector of Fillingham in 1361, but also Warden of Canterbury Hall in 1365. The mendicant orders were the objects of his first aggression on the spiritual despotisms of his day. In the Church of the Middle Ages, the Blessed Virgin and the Saints were the real objects of worship. God the Father was so far withdrawn into the unsearchable distance and shrouded in clouds of metaphysical speculation that all ideas of his fatherhood and his love were lost in those of awe, mystery, or judgment. Christ, indeed, could be approached, but only by favor of his court above and the officers of his household below. Of these last, the prelates and the clergy of the church, the former were themselves almost inaccessible in their worldly greatness. 
they rivaled and in many cases surpassed the hereditary nobles in their wealth and pomp, monopolized the high offices of state, and threw their energies into the struggle of politics rather than the work of the chief pastor and evangelist. The lower clergy aped their superiors as far as their means would allow, and though their office was still held in honor, they had lost the personal respect and confidence of the people by their indolence, sensualism, and venality. Throughout the popular literature of the times, the typical priest is represented as a necessary evil, but more to be dreaded in a household than a venomous reptile, as a parasite, a hypocrite, a glutton, and the chief and habitual corrupter of female virtue. It was as a counter-influence to the intensely worldly spirit of the secular clergy, as the parish priests were called in contradistinction to the monkish fraternities, that the famous mendicant orders of St. Francis and St. Dominic had been established in the preceding century, and their influence had at first been so beneficent that gross test the great reforming bishop of Lincoln, was glad to avail himself of their services in England, and lent them his name and authority. The orders soon began not only to draw to themselves all the ability and fervent devotional feeling of the age, but to offer the most hopeful career to religious ambition. Many ecclesiastics already highly placed forsook their dignities and enrolled themselves among these fraternities, in the hope of still loftier advancement, for the mendicants had supplied many bishops and cardinals, and no less than four popes, in the last fifty years of the thirteenth century. The orders had become one of the great powers of the earth, were deeply tainted with the all-prevailing worldliness of the times, and had utterly lost the spirit, though they still affected the externals of poverty. Wycliffe's soul rebelled against the patent fact that the kingdom of Christ had virtually become the kingdom of this world, and he threw himself with all the passionate earnestness of his nature into the task of purifying, elevating, and spiritualizing the religion of his day, and bringing back a corrupt church to something like the ideal set forth in the New Testament. He published a little book called The Poor Caitiff, a collection of tracts the purpose of which, he says, was to teach simple men and women the way to heaven. He established a fraternity of poor priests, who were to go about preaching and constantly mingling with the poor, an institution combining the discipline and ready obedience of a religious order, with the individual liberty of action and free development of personal gifts, which characterized the first lay preachers under John Wesley. These poor priests, with their fresh and hearty teaching, their unaffected poverty, and their friendly intercourse with the people in their perpetual itineracy, were no doubt the chief instruments in the rapid and extraordinary diffusion of the new doctrine. One of Wycliffe's bitterest enemies tells us, You cannot travel anywhere in England, but of every two men you meet in the road, one of them would be a lollard. This was the name given to the followers of Wycliffe from a Bohemian word, lalin, to sing or lull, as we have it in our lullaby. People laughed at them at first as harmless fanatics, but before five and twenty years were passed, they had begun to be martyrs, and we find a century further on a very grave jest at their expense in Erasmus, who expresses a hope that either lollardism or persecution would stop before winter, for it raised the price of firewood. To attack the mendicants was indeed to disturb a hornet's nest, a step on which no timid or worldly wise man would have ventured. They were in the habit of selling shares and masses for the dead, and indulgences and absolutions for the living, as Tetzel did a century and a half later in Luther's time. Thus Wycliffe said, they make property in ghostly goods, where no property may be, and professed to have no property in worldly goods, where alone property is lawful. The beginning of his strife with the mendicants dates from the time of his residence at Oxford, which university had suffered severely from their insidious encroachments. 
they had stirred up the scholars to sedition and seduced them from their colleges into their own monasteries and the number of students was enormously reduced it is said from thirty thousand to six thousand by the dread of sending children to a university where they were thus liable to be kidnapped frères says wycliffe drawn children for christ's religion into their private order by hypocrisia and lazings and staling children for father and mother but his next appearance was on a wider stage in thirteen sixty six he found himself embroiled in a controversy involving the very principles of papal authority in england owing to the non-fulfilment of the conditions of the peace of bretigny a new war was inevitable and in fact imminent and at this juncture pope urban v in the interests of his french master put forward a demand for the arrears of the papal tribute of one thousand marks a year which king john had covenanted to pay in acknowledgment of his holding england and ireland as fiefs under innocent the third the claim for tribute had been admitted by the feebler plantagenet kings but repudiated by the first and third edwards and parliament was now summoned to consider the pope's demand for the arrears of thirty-three years it is not too much to say that at this time the predominant feeling in parliament was hatred to the pope and their reenactment of the first statute of praemunire a short time previously placing provisors out of the protection of the law ought to have convinced him that they were hardly in a mood to accede to any papal demand least of all to one the mention of which recalled to mind the period of their country's greatest degradation they unanimously resolved that king john having no power to give away his kingdom without the concurrence of parliament the claim fell to the ground and they promised to stand loyally by the king in his resistance thereto wycliffe was publicly invited to defend the course taken in the refusal of the papal tribute and startled the orthodox world by laying down the novel but when once stated incontrovertible doctrine that king and parliament are supreme in all causes over ecclesiastics as well as over laymen in the year thirteen sixty eight wycliffe published his treatise de dominio divino in the preface of which he unconsciously fixes the date of the true commencement of the reformation by declaring that henceforth he would dedicate his time exclusively to theology this resolution to which he finally adhered was probably not taken till he had despaired of church reform in its political and social aspect when wycliffe called upon the pope and the bishops to lay aside their purple to live frugally watch and pray and do the work of an evangelist he carried with him the whole heart of the laity just as in fact grosteste had done a century before when he denounced the worldliness of the clergy but it must be borne in mind in estimating the boldness and originality of wycliffe's work that up to this time the doctrine of the church had remained for centuries unchallenged and was received with unquestioning faith by the mass of the people that doctrine it was the object of his life henceforward to purify and reinvigorate by bringing it back to the standard of primitive simplicity a task which he set about in the spirit of an earnest and courageous but it must be confessed a somewhat ruthless controversialist this is not the place to discuss the directly religious teachings of wycliffe which indeed belongs properly to the next reign suffice it to say in the words of a recent biographer that there is scarcely any doctrine now prominently set forth by the church of england which was not insisted upon by him scarcely an error against which the church of england practically protests which wycliffe does not treat in a manner which anticipates and justifies our modern objections his positive doctrines may be summed up in the assertion of personal responsibility the supremacy of the scriptures and salvation by faith his negative teaching in the denial of the necessity of priestly mediation and of all the superstitions which cluster round it 
especially that of a miraculous change effected by consecration in the elements of the Lord's Supper. It was the promulgation of this last heresy which united king, lords, and commons with the exasperated hierarchy against him. He was summoned before convocation at Oxford and solemnly banished from the university, upon which he retired finally to his living at Lutterworth, devoting himself before and after the first attack of that paralysis of which he afterwards died, to writing, to pastoral work, and to his translation of the Bible. Of that work a clerical contemporary of his thus writes, This master, John Wycliffe, hath translated the Bible out of Latin into English, and thus laid it more open to the laity and to women that can read, than it had formerly been to the most learned of the clergy, and in this way the gospel pearl is cast abroad and trodden under foot of swine. In such language as this, prejudice and bigotry could speak of an effort which may be said without exaggeration to have for ever rolled back the stone from the well of the water of life. Wycliffe died in 1384 and was buried in peace in his own churchyard. But thirty years later, the Council of Constance ordered his remains to be dug up and thrown far away out of consecrated ground. His body was burned, and the ashes flung into the swift, which runs by the village of Lutterworth. The brook, says Fuller, did convey his ashes to the Avon, Avon into Severn, Severn into the narrow seas, they into the main ocean, and thus the ashes of Wycliffe were an emblem of his doctrine, which is now dispersed all the world over. These events, of course, took place beyond the limits assigned to this narrative. But Wycliffe is the chief figure in a stormy scene which closes the political history of the reign of Edward III. In February 1377, he was summoned to appear before Courtney, the Bishop of London. The charges then made against him were of a purely political character, the object of the prosecution being to assail the Duke of Lancaster through his principal supporter, and, as Dr. Shirley says, to proclaim to the world that the principles which the Duke was putting into practice against the Church were subversive not only of that institution, but of society itself. The trial took place in that noble Gothic church which, till the great fire in 1666, stood upon the site of the present St. Paul's. Barons, prelates, and doctors from all parts of England had taken their seats when a tumultuous mob rushed in and filled every corner of the building before Wycliffe's arrival, for the trial excited the most passionate interest, and the popular feeling, for some unexplained reason, ran strongly against the reformer. When he took his place before his judges, the whole of the circle were seated and he left standing. The Earl Marshal, Lord Percy, who had come with the Duke to support Wycliffe, ordered a seat to be given him. The Bishop of London refused, and a fierce dispute arose between him and the Duke, the former retaining his temper and dignity, the Duke turning red with rage and muttering, that he would drag the bishop out of the church by the hair of his head. The Londoners overhearing the threat pressed tumultuously and menacingly round their bishop, and the assembly broke up in the utmost disorder. The following day the excitement increased. The mob rushed to the duke's palace of the Savoy, beating to death by the way an unfortunate priest, who had incurred their wrath by stigmatizing the duke's prisoner, Sir Peter de la Mare as a traitor. The Duke himself was absent, so the rioters contented themselves with hanging up his arms reversed, like those of a traitor, in the principal streets. He, meanwhile, had fled to Kennington and sheltered himself under the popularity of the Princess of Wales, who, as the widow of the people's friend, the Black Prince, was dear to the heart of every citizen. King Edward breathed his last on June 21, 1377, in his palace at Sheen, in the 66th year of his age and the 51st of his reign. His jubilee had been celebrated a short time previously, 
and a general pardon granted to all offenders with the express exception of William of Wickham. It is difficult to read without emotion the brief description handed down to us of the deathbed of this magnificent prince, long honoured as the mirror of chivalry and envied as the favourite of fortune. Alice Perez remained by his bedside till he began to sink, but a few moments before he breathed his last, she drew the jewelled ring from his unresisting finger and left the palace. His attendants had dispersed through the rooms in search of plunder, and he was left alone to die when a priest entered unbidden and held up the crucifix before his fast-glazing eyes. The king summoned strength to thank him, took the crucifix in his hands, kissed it, wept, and expired. End of section 37section 38 of edward the third by william parsons warburton this librivox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami concluding chapter part one character of edward the third and of his reign it is no light task to attempt to form a due estimate of the character of king edward the third he and his gallant son have so long been recognized heroes of English romance that it is far easier to join in the chorus of admiration than to criticize or faintly praise. Edward III, from an external point of view, undoubtedly ranked as the foremost man of his time, and always bore himself worthily of the great personage that he was of middle stature but gracefully and strongly built he had a winning address and commanding countenance a godlike face the old chronicler says his training was well adapted to fit him for his exalted place but if we are to believe that he received an admirable education the expression must be taken relatively for in the fourteenth century and long after the culture of a gentleman consisted chiefly in the acquisition of such accomplishments as breaking a spear and holding a hawk gracefully, riding, dancing, dressing, and carving to perfection. But book learning was left to louts. It would be a bold assertion that he could read, write, or speak English. In his youth, the language of the court and the feudal castle was exclusively Norman French, that is to say, a French patois only half naturalized in a foreign country, and in fact a corruption of a corruption, of which speech, said Chaucer, the Frenchmen have as good a fantasy as we have in hearing of Frenchmen's English. He was doubtless acquainted with Latin or the barbarous jargon which went by the name, a great deal of it being no better than English words with Latin terminations the use of which was so general that not only were the records and other state papers written therein, but accounts were kept and political songs composed in Latin. As for the origin and history of this language, the poet Gower, one of the most learned men of the age, conjectures that Latin was invented by the old prophetess Carmens, but that Aristarchus, Donatus, and Didymus regulated its syntax and prosody. The highest geographical authority of the fourteenth and following century, Higden, author of its Polychronicon, was not acquainted with the fact that the earth is a globe, and like Herodotus, peopled its unexplored regions with dragons, satyrs, and devils. Sir John Mandeville, who had been himself a great traveller, tells of Ethiopians with only one foot, but that as large as a parasol. Giants twenty-eight feet long and foul and evil women who have precious stones for eyes and slay with beholding like a basilisk all the best learning and talent of the age were engrossed and absorbed in the childish unprofitable subtleties of scholastic speculation which was then believed to be the highest form of intellectual exercise and about which a few words must be said at the latter end of the middle ages very few Europeans, even among those reputed good scholars, were acquainted with the Greek language. 
In the 12th century, however, the writings of Aristotle became known in the West at third hand through Latin translations of Arabic versions. A mixture of Arabian and Greek philosophy rapidly interpenetrated the whole of the theology of Europe, and Greek and Arabian terms and dialectics or methods of reasoning became the forms in which all theological discussion was carried out. In this treadmill of human thought and ingenuity, whole lives were spent and whole libraries composed, the single result of which labor has been to fill posterity with barren amazement, an amazement such as we feel on beholding the pyramids, at the stupendous waste of power for no discoverable use. Edward was indeed more of a soldier than a scholar, and also more of a soldier than of a general. The king himself or his marshals, for he understood the royal art of choosing good men, made undoubtedly a happy selection of the ground on which to fight the Battle of Crecy, and skillfully disposed the handful of men who were to stand up against the great army of France. Even that victorious struggle was an example not so much of successful generalship as of the latent capabilities of brave men, animated, not depressed by the sense of danger, and facing overwhelming odds with the deliberate fury of some wild hunted animal who will no longer withdraw before his pursuers, but turns to bay at last, armed with the tenfold strength of rage and despair, to sell his life as dearly as he can. In the battle off Slush, Edward fought with the ferocious courage of the House of Anjou, but his campaigns were in most instances unprofitable and inglorious. There is little to show that he possessed the higher qualities of a warrior, and to attempt to rank him with the greatest strategists and captains of all time is to provoke an idle controversy. As a soldier and a legislator, he looms large between Edward II and Richard II, but seems a man of ordinary stature when measured with the great First Edward or the greater First William. He can hardly be called a great statesman, but in the absence of any minister of conspicuous ability, he seems to gather up in himself all the powers of the administration and to be the sole exponent of the national will. His reign presents a marked contrast to those of his successors, in which the king is lost or distinguishable only by a crown and scepter, amid a turbulent crowd of actors. From the day when, as yet a boy, he dragged down Mortimer from his pride of place, Edward III was master of his own house, and no subject dared to approach the throne but with bowed head and bended knee. He understood better perhaps than any other sovereign of his dynasty the great importance of keeping on good terms with his people, and almost in every successive parliament he had the credit of making concessions to the nation, but he was in all probability quite as arbitrary as the most arbitrary of his predecessors. The very fact that the great charter and the charter providing against the extension of the forests were reenacted and confirmed twelve times in his reign is sufficient evidence that they were infringed upon at least an equal number of times. Over and over he pledged himself to observe the statute of Edward I, de talagio non cocedendo, and not to impose arbitrary taxes on the people but always with some reservation which enabled him, without actual breach of faith, to reimpose them under the plea of necessity. He pursued the objects of his ambition with a keenness and intensity of purpose which often made him forgetful of his kingly obligations as well as of the sufferings of his people. He was prudent as well as bold, but his prudence had a short range and hardly amounted like his grandfather's to sagacity, while his measures dealing with the symptoms rather than with the disease are wanting in the character of breadth and permanence. To assert that Edward III did not act upon the true principles of political and social science 
is only to say, in other words, that he was not centuries in advance of his time. But it is difficult altogether to acquit him of the charge, which indeed he more than once cynically admitted, of having taken measures to increase the revenue of the crown at the expense of the interests of the nation at large. He was a genuine Englishman in his rough and ready and often incoherent policy, in his contempt of foreigners and in his audacious confidence in himself and his countrymen, in his love of manly exertion, his personal pride and popular sympathies, and his freedom from lasting enmity and vindictiveness. He might almost be called a typical Englishman, were it not for a certain love of frippery, fine clothes, and scenic effect, which he probably inherited with his French blood. That his reign was unusually free from scandals, to which indeed the connection of his dotage with Alice Perez is the chief exception, is perhaps mainly due to the admirable choice of a wife made for him by his execrable mother for there is little to induce us to believe that with all his ceremonial devoutness he aimed at higher purity of life than his contemporaries in an age when all things were condoned to all men and indeed to all women so long as they kept on good terms with holy church he was it may readily be granted the embodiment of the popular ideal of chivalry in his time but that ideal was very far removed from the ideal set forth by romance in King Arthur and Sir Galahad. We cannot indeed too warmly admire the nobler features of medieval chivalry, its discipline, valor, courtesy, devotion, and respect for the weaker sex. But the annals of the time prove only too clearly and constantly that these characteristics were not incompatible with selfishness, impurity, greed, class pride, and vindictiveness, and cruelty, or that heartless levity which is the worst form of cruelty to the individual woman. Before the end of Edward III's reign, chivalry had begun to show its first symptoms of decline. The marked success of the cautious and unchivalrous tactics which Charles the Wise had adopted at the suggestion of Du Guesclin, the introduction of new methods of fighting, which deprived highly trained horsemen of their former superiority and comparative invulnerability in battle, had all tended to bring it into discredit. But it was not doomed to extinction for many a long day. Chaucer, indeed, in the rhyme of Sir Topaz, makes open fun of the chivalric histories, and almost anticipates Don Quixote, but it was the courtiers of Queen Elizabeth who first exchanged the two-handed cross-hilted sword for the rapier, and it was another fifty years before chivalry received its death blow amidst the general laughter of mankind in the immortal novel of Cervantes though chivalry had unquestionably a large share in the formation of much that is admirable in our national English habits of thought and action, we need waste no regrets over its decline and fall. All that was independent of accident and circumstance, all that was really worth preserving in that splendid but imperfect type of character, survives amongst us still, adapted to the altered conditions of the times, in the ideal of a gentleman. Feudalism and chivalry decline together. The cramped and narrow theory of tenure by military service, in feudal times the keystone of the social system, was giving way before a multitude of new and complicated reciprocal relations which sprang up with increasing wealth and intelligence on the one hand, and the growing necessities of finding a broader basis for authority on the other. European society was being reconstructed out of old and simpler elements, which had been breaking up and were crumbling away. The Catholic Church itself, hitherto the type of compactness and immobility, was beginning to feel the influences of this remarkable period of transition in the attacks made by bolder spirits on her doctrine and discipline. The chief interest of the age of Edward III does not lie upon the surface, and its secret is altogether missed by the contemporary chronicler Foissart, 
to whom we owe such a minute and spirited but superficial picture of the reign its real glories spring not from its gigantic military efforts which only wasted the resources of the country and even when crowned with almost miraculous success produced absolutely no abiding results but from its calamities and disasters from the black death which emancipated the english serf from the loss of aquitaine which at once and for ever stamped its insular and independent character upon the english nation and monarchy from the enormous drain of money which constantly brought the king face to face with his people and taught him and his nobles that if a nation is to put forth its united strength in the hour of need its rulers must learn to take account of the wrongs of the many as well as of the rights of the few it is a striking illustration of what has been called the irony of human events that while from the point of view of the principal actors in the scene nothing remains of the great war for the crown of france but the memory of dazzling and unsubstantial triumphs its indirect and unforeseen effects the concessions which it was the means of wringing from royal prerogative and feudal tyranny are felt among us to this day and remain as real fruitful and unalienable accessions to the ever-widening empire of human freedom the interest of the history of the fourteenth century is not to be compared with the wonderful awakening of europe as from a frost-bound winter sleep in the thirteenth but it possesses a peculiar interest and importance of its own it will be indeed remembered by our countrymen chiefly as the age in which their forefathers proved that englishmen were the hardest hitters in europe and won victory after victory against desperate odds it is in vain for cold reason to contend against the spell of the names of crecy and poitiers they will forever stir the english heart like the blast of a trumpet or the rustling of a consecrated banner but these battles are not after all the true titles of the age to honour searching deeper down we shall find and thankfully admit that the century was one not of conquest but of transition development emancipation and characterised by a silent and gradual contraction of the area of privilege and a corresponding enlargement of the area of liberty. End of section thirty eight. Section thirty nine of Edward the Third by William Parsons Warburton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Concluding chapter, part two. Social condition of the period domestic habits food and dress of the people on looking into the social condition of the period the first fact which strikes us is that the elements of society were in those days so simple and so few there was first the sovereign nominally subject to the laws but invested with ill-defined hereditary prerogatives scarcely diminished from those first yielded to william the norman by a conquered and prostrate country there were the powerful aristocratic class beginning with the kinsmen and connections of the king and ending with the greater barons who all held their fiefs or estates by barony or in chief from the crown these constituted the great men of the land les grands de la terre as they were constantly called and like the bishops les prelats who also held directly under the crown and certain mitred abbots of monasteries had the right of being summoned personally to parliament there is a good deal of obscurity still attaching to the position of the lesser barons as those lords were called who could command the services of a number of knights holding fiefs under them but who by reason of more recent creation alienation forfeiture or subdivision of estates were not in possession of ancient hereditary privileges these the king appears to have summoned to parliament or not at his discretion next in rank came the knights bannerets who though not ennobled were like the barons 
in possession of a plurality of knights' fees, could bring vassal knights into the field, and were consequently entitled to cut off the long streamer of the pennon of the knight bachelor, and thus convert it into the square banner, as John of Chandos did for the first time on the field of Navarrete. To be a knight, even of the lowest class, was to be gentle, and placed a man on a footing of equality in arms with the highest noble of the land. But this theory had, to a great extent, given way in this transition period, and enactments were not unfrequently made or renewed, compelling all persons in possession of a certain income to take up the order of knighthood, partly with a view of securing the fees for the king's exchequer, and partly to enable him to command their military services with greater speed and certainty. Still the knights, whatever their original status, looked upon themselves as belonging to the aristocracy, and shrank from contamination with the trading classes, who were often their superiors in wealth, education, and intelligence. It was only in the parliamentary struggle, as has so often happened in practical England, that the strong class feeling yielded to considerations of a common political interest for nothing short of a close union of forces between the knights of the shires and the mercantile representatives of the towns could have enabled them to maintain the war of independence of the fourteenth century against the nobles and the crown the great english middle class was the growth of a later age but no doubt the nucleus of it was created by the stimulus given to trade and commerce in the reign of edward the third his constant prohibition and removal of prohibitions on the export of wool, though contrary to all sound principles of political economy, were one of the chief causes which led to a third, and this time a friendly, continental invasion of Britain, bearing in some of its aspects no less importantly on her future than that of the English or of the Normans. For the French Flemish weavers, who could not carry on their finer manufactures without a regular supply of English wool, came over in large numbers and settled on the eastern coasts. They were constantly in want of fresh hands, and as they offered high wages, a continual immigration took place from all parts of England to the Norfolk towns, where the weavers chiefly established themselves it became their interest to harbour and conceal the fugitive serfs or villains who fled from the forced labour which they were compelled to render at home to their lords for by a residence of a year and a day in any town a serf acquired the right of disposing of his labour when and where he pleased this district of england was already in constant communication with the northern ports of europe for yarmouth lynn and blakeney were already famous emporiums for the Baltic trade, just then beginning to become a highly important interest. Fish being a necessary of life in Roman Catholic countries, the comparative failure of the fisheries which had taken place on the northern coasts of Europe had induced numbers of traders from the Hansa towns in the north of Germany to settle on the coast of Norfolk in order to export red herrings and other dried fish for the wants of the faithful in their own old continental homes. The ships which conveyed the herrings thither brought back supplies of tallow and other Baltic produce, especially furs, then worn by all persons of a certain rank in England, from the unexplored forests of Russia. These traders were known by the name of Easterlings, and an interesting evidence, perhaps of the character of their trading, certainly of the esteem in which their money was held, has come down to us in the familiar word sterling, which we apply to coin of known and unquestioned purity, and which is now in fact appropriated in common usage to our English coin. In order to realize the close ties which united King Edward with Van Arteveld, and the burgomasters of the Hansa towns, we have only to remember that the eastern counties were then swarming with traders and workers, much in the same way as the northwestern are at present. The great fair at Stourbridge, now scarcely remembered on the spot, was a world-famous gathering in those days, and rivaled the great fair of Novgorod in Russia. It lasted three weeks in every September. September. 
temporary streets and bazaars were erected for the sale of all then known articles of commerce the neighbouring harbours were crammed with the ships of every nation from which had disembarked the venetians and genoese with the produce of the far east and their own country velvets and silks and armour the spaniards with war-horses and iron the norwegians with their pitch the gascons with their wine the easterlings with their tallow and furs this tide of importation from abroad was met by another setting from the interior of england salt from worcestershire lead from derbyshire dairy and farm produce brought by the bailiff from many a near and distant manor and the famous english wool packs which manufacturers from north and south of europe would bid against each other to secure so prized were sheep of the english stock that it was forbidden by law to sell or export rams for the improvement of foreign breeds but there is a tradition that a few of these animals surreptitiously conveyed over sea were the ancestors of the famous spanish merinos the exportation of iron which used to be smelted in sussex was forbidden by act of parliament in thirteen fifty four next in the social scale to the opulent and the enterprising trader came the sturdy yeomen or tenant farmers who had for generations held their land in free sockage as it was called either by a fixed rent or by service to their lord and formed the strength of the english army as long bowmen and men-at-arms below these came the class of villains or serfs who could not quit the manor on which they were born were liable to forced labour had to pay a fine on marriage or on sending a child to school or virtually on any other occasion which the lord might make a pretext for attacking their little hordes in time of war the serf might be impressed though only a boy of sixteen or a man in those days an elderly man of fifty or sixty and sent into battle armed only with a quilted jacket skull-cap knife and lance to stand up against the hardy strokes of knights and men-at-arms carrying mail and battle-axe all that they had to expect was in case of their side being victorious to rush in and stab and rifle the fallen foe or in case of defeat to be slaughtered without mercy adding perhaps a cipher to the sum total of the slain their cottages were miserable huts made of wattle plastered with mud often standing below the level of the soil with one apartment only and no chimneys windows or ventilation their habits were filthy scurvy and leprosy made fearful ravages among them partly on account of the total neglect of the commonest precautions for health and cleanliness and partly on account of their having to go for months together without fresh meat or vegetables it was the custom of the times on the tenth of november in each year to kill off all the cattle not wanted for stock and to salt down the meat for winter use they had of course no potatoes nor any other esculent roots except onions no vegetables except cabbage wheat was upon the whole remarkably cheap if we consider the wretched system of agriculture in those days a penny would purchase six pounds meat was also cheap neither beef nor mutton cost more than a farthing a pound butter and cheese about a half penny all this while the lowest rate of wages even before the rise occasioned by the black death was threepence a day wycliffe says that the poor in his time lived longer and better than the rich melius et diutius we want quat corpus and the spanish ambassador of philip the second two centuries later writes thus to his master these peasants live like hogs but they fare as well as the king their dress consisted of a rough pair of shoes frequently of untanned leather a pair of galligaskins breeches of leather and a frock of russet or undyed wool for they were forbidden by law to wear a more costly material the dress of the middle class was of much the same make but of finer texture for it was in this particular that the gradations of rank were statutably marked its cut may be seen any day in the alderman's gown in the dress of the scholars of christ's hospital and in eau well-known portrait of the poet chaucer 
The nobles, however, vied with each other in the splendor, costliness, and extravagance of their clothing. Both sexes wore in Edward III's reign a tight-fitting vest called a catardi, from the sleeves of which hung long slips of cloth, and over this a large flowing mantle, buttoned at the shoulder, of scarlet or some equally brilliant color, the edges, dagged or jagged, and cut in the form of leaves. The cotardi was gorgeously embroidered, and the whole of the costume was of the most costly and showy materials that could be procured. It is said that feathers were then first worn in hats. They had small hoods tied under the chin and set with gold, silver, and precious stones. Lyra pipes or tippets hung round the neck and down to the feet, all dagged. The hose were pied or party-colored. Their shoes and pattens sandaled and pinked more than a finger long, bending upwards, which they called crack hose, resembling the claws of birds, and looped up to the knees with chains of gold and silver. Ladies' hair was gathered up and confined in a band of gold thread, and there was as much freedom in the shape and arrangement of the mass as prevails at the present time. The head was, however, in those days enveloped in a kerchief, couvreche, the neck swathed in a napkin. Chaucer's description of the Canterbury pilgrims is a repertory of information in the dress of his day. He says of the wife of Bath, supposed to be a well-dressed woman, Her gour sheaves were full fien of grund, ye doos the swear they weren't a pound, that on the Sunday weren't ye the edda, er a ozen weren't a fien scarlet red, full straight ye teed, Upon an ambler easily she sat, he wimpled well and on her head a at, as broad as is a buckler or a targa. A foot a month la booter eep is larga, and on her fate a pair of spores sharp. The great art of the age was architecture. Monasteries and abbeys were no longer built, for the taste of the times had changed. But manors, hospitals, castles, schools, and colleges were then erected, which modern architects can only feebly imitate. The manor house in which the bailiff frequently lived in his lord's absence may be taken as the typical dwelling of the period, for the feudal castle differed from it only in a multiplication of the same simple arrangement of elements. It consisted of a central building with an enclosure surrounded by a ditch and palings. The building itself contained a large hall running up to the open tiling of the roof, in which the family and servants ate their meals and lived during the day, and the latter slept by night, either on the rush-strewn floor or on benches round the walls, the garment of the day serving for the coverlet at night. A door at one end of the hall opened into the chamber or sleeping room of the females of the family, and another door at the other end into the stable. In smaller houses of this class, cooking, like all other domestic processes, went on in the hall, but in those of more pretension, a kitchen took the place of the stable, and a solar or upper chamber was built over the sleeping apartment approached most commonly by an external staircase, and toward the end of the eleventh century a parloir or parlor, so called, from being the room for interviews, was added. The hall was the room of the house, and in addition to the uses already described, it was the place in which small offenses were tried and justice administered. The manor court, presided over by the seneschal or steward, in the absence of the lord, was not unlike the local magistracy of our day. These courts exercised police powers in cases of trespass, evasion of duty, false weights, and breaches of the peace. But many of them possessed what was known as the high jurisdiction, the right of fossa and furca, that is, of hanging male and drowning female criminals. The door of the hall generally stood open in token of hospitality, but it was a breach of good manners for the passer-by to look in. The hall had no chimneys, and the smoke found its way out as it could. Nor was this so difficult as it might seem, for the roof was very imperfectly fitted, and the openings through which light was admitted were either unprotected 
or filled up with a cross bar degrading by day and a curtain or shutter by night. Glass for windows was unknown except in the palaces of kings, and rarely found even in these. The furniture was of the simplest kind. The seats were either slabs in recesses of the wall or boards laid upon trestles. The table at which in the humbler manners the whole household took their meals together was constructed in the same manner and removed when not wanted. In the houses of a higher class there was generally a dais or slightly raised platform at the upper end on which stood a permanent or dormant table for the use of the family and honoured guests. Two or more perches or wooden frames were fixed to the wall and on one of them sat the domestic birds, hawks, falcons, and etc., and on the other were suspended articles of clothing of various kinds, and frequently armor. Another common article of furniture was the dresser, a series of shelves for exhibiting the plate at banquets, frequently so high as to require steps to be provided to enable the servants to reach the upper shelves. Our ancestors in the fourteenth century kept early hours. It was the custom to rise with the sun, and we read of a party who was ridiculed at having overslept themselves when found in bed at six. The usual dinner hour was nine in the morning. The family were summoned to it by the blowing of horns, and the first step after assembling in the hall for meals was washing the hands, for which purpose each guest was served with a basin, ewer, and towel. It was not till after the guests were seated round the table that the cloth was laid, on it were then set the salt cellars, knives, occasionally spoons, and bread and cups of wine. There were no forks nor plates. The fingers were thought to answer all the purposes of the former, and instead of the latter, each couple of guests had between them a large tranchoir or trencher, that is to say, a thick flat slice of bread of second quality, on which a portion of fish or meat sufficient for two was laid, and on which it was carved, the gravy, as a rule, running through upon the tablecloth. As soon as the course was finished, the trenchers were thrown into the alms-basket for the use of the poor. At the conclusion of the meal, the table was removed, basins and ewers were a second time supplied for washing the hands, which doubtless was by this time again necessary, and cups of wine were handed round to the guests, still sitting as at dinner after which the minstrels were introduced. The minstrels, or jongleurs, so called from a corruption of jugleur or joculatores, our jugglers, were an important class in the Middle Ages and an indispensable element at a festival. They led a life of perpetual wandering and were always welcome, partly for their art's sake and partly for the sake of the news which they brought, for news was then a scarce commodity. If the after-dinner guests were in a serious mood, the jonglers would sing old romances of love and chivalry. If they found the company mirthfully disposed, they sang satirical and political songs, or related amusing stories, or exhibited feats of tumbling and sleight of hand, and their tales, songs, and performances were often of a character which painfully illustrates the coarse licentiousness at this time pervading all classes of society. The fourteenth century was not a busy or industrious age. People who lived in the country were in no hurry to break up the social gathering, and after the meal, says a contemporary romance, they then go to play as each likes best, either in forests or on rivers, that is, hawking. For waterfowl such as the heron and the teal were the chief quarry or prey of the hawk, or in amusements of other kinds, chess, tables, and dice. The evening meal was at five o'clock, after which we are told the family usually went to bed, for artificial light was bad and dear. Wax was used only in palaces and churches, and even tallow was tuppence per pound an enormous price. A candle offered at the shrine of a saint was in the truest sense an oblation, for it cost the bearer the sacrifice of a rare personal pleasure. Wood fires were almost universal. Charcoal, indeed, was occasionally used in the dwellings of the rich, but coal appears to have been employed for smelting purposes only. 
reading was no common accomplishment, and books, being of course still written with the hand, were few and beyond the reach of all but the richest, and the chief intellectual entertainment of well-to-do persons was to listen to the songs or recitations of the professional jongleur, or those of amateurs belonging to their own class, who were well versed in such lore. End of section 39section forty of edward the third by william parsons warburton this librivox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami concluding chapter part three language and literature vision of piers ploughman the canterbury tales as has been already said in other terms latin was the language of business and french the language of society in the earlier part of the reign of Edward III, graver works were composed in Latin, but all the higher literature was in French, and in subject and form a close imitation of French originals. The chivalrous romance and the legends of martyrs and the fableaux or rhyming tales had given way to the now universal passion for allegorical poetry, in which the characters introduced were impersonations of virtues and vices, such as was the romance of the rose by the translation of which chaucer first gained the ear of the people up to the beginning of the fourteenth century the supremacy of the french language in england had been almost unchallenged its introduction was by no means due to the norman conquest though that event undoubtedly gave it a new impulse for it had been the court language of edward the confessor it is said that William the Conqueror tried to learn English, but his successors made no such attempt. The Trouvères, who sang in the rugged Languedoc, found a special encouragement at court from the two queens of Henry I, and during the long succession of the earlier Angevin sovereigns, who were to all intents and purposes Frenchmen, the royal influence was favourable to the growth of French. The two Eleanors, whom Henry II and Henry III brought from the south of France, carried with them the soft Provençal, the long duck of the troubadours, and in the reign of the last-named sovereign such was the undisguised preference of the court for everything French, and such the consequent influx of adventurers of that nation, that the ancient English element in the people seemed a second time threatened with helotry or extinction but all this time the english language had survived the saxon chronicle comes to an abrupt conclusion in the reign of king stephen but about a century and a half before the reign of edward the third the vernacular again crops up mingling in grotesque incongruity with the latin of the mystery plays the less dignified scenes of which were sometimes in the vulgar tongue while the more stately spectacle continued to be given in latin it was and always had been the language of the common people and had consequently undergone a deterioration in purity and structure analogous to that of the lingua romana rustica spoken in the roman provinces under the empire in which process prepositions took the place of inflections for case and auxiliaries the place of inflection for voice and tense it is possible that to complete the parallel there existed side by side with the degraded saxon a literary and inflected english language but be this as it may the time was now come for its revival as a national tongue and the speech of our forefathers as well as their ecclesiastical and civil polity was to feel the developing and renovating influences of the age it is not a little remarkable that the language and free institutions of England should have thus grown up together. The name of Wycliffe is closely associated with both movements, and though his fame as the day star of the Reformation has thrown somewhat into the shade his literary achievements, it must never be forgotten that his influence as a reformer was mainly due to his English translation of the scriptures and that in his controversial attack upon the strongholds of superstition and priestly monopoly he had as it were to forge the weapon with which he fought 
but it was not till the century was entering its fourth quarter and the reign of edward the third was drawing to a close that wycliffe's english writings became generally known and long before that time we have abundant proof that english was taking the place of french wrestling with it and overcoming it higden already mentioned as a literary man of this century tells us writing before the beginning of the french war that in his time boys at school against the usage and manner of all other nations be compelled to leave their own language and to construe their latin lessons and their things into french his translator trevisa who lived at the latter end of edward the third's reign in commenting on this passage tells us that it was not so then in all the grammar schools children leaveth french and learneth in english in the memorable year thirteen sixty two it was decreed in a statute itself worded in french that henceforth the proceedings in the law courts should be conducted in english the reason given that the french tongue is much unknown in england three years later the lord chancellor opened parliament in an english speech but in its growth and development language follows laws of its own irrespective of artificial stimulants or checks during the long struggle against the domination of foreigners in england which took place in the reign of henry the third a complete fusion had been effected between the norman and english elements of the race the far-sighted measures of simon de montfort had united the nobles with the commonalty by giving them each a common voice in legislation and the great french war in edward the third's reign by the self-reliance which it engendered and the antipathies which it fostered stamped for ever upon the english nation its insular united and independent character it began to be felt not consciously perhaps but instinctively that the time was come for england to have a language and a literature of her own and chaucer like other men of genius seized upon and gave expression to the feeling of the age in his testament of love he thus apologizes for writing in english let then clerkes and deaton in latin and let franchmen in their franche also in deaton their quaint terms for it is keenly to their mouths but let us shew our fantasias in such words as were learned then of our dumbest tongue but some twenty years before the appearance of chaucer's great work the canterbury tales the vision of piers ploughman had become the delight of the english people this may fairly be called the first genuine english poem for we had before it only the dreary versified histories of wace and robert of gloucester more prosy than prose itself and norman rather than english the vision dates from the year thirteen sixty five tradition gives the author a name robert langland and a birthplace clebury mortimer in shropshire and he is also said on the same doubtful authority to have been a secular priest or as we should say a country parson he wrote in the words and idioms of the alliterative measures of the old anglo-saxon poetry perhaps still familiar to the people's ear but in the plan of his poem he had adopted the allegorical impersonations of the trouvere alliteration or the stringing together of words or syllables beginning with the same letter is his only poetical artifice as for rhyme he discards it altogether in tone and sentiment and independence of thought as well as in diction and subject matter this extraordinary work is thoroughly english and breathes the fresh bracing air of the malvern hills among which the ploughman fell asleep to dream his dream he is always in deep not to say in grim earnest he finds the times out of joint full of contrasts and contradictions and marvellously me met as i may you tell all the wealth of the world and its woe both the world lying in wickedness misery and corruption and the church which should be the salt of the earth among its chief corruptors more worldly than the world itself it was he who commenced the great revolt in asserting the supremacy of reason conscience and holy scripture as the guides of faith and conduct he undermines the sacerdotal claim to the direction of the inner life of man 
penances and pilgrimages are nothing worth in comparison of charity which with st paul he held to be greater than faith and an image of the mercy of god of which he says all the wickedness of the world that man might work or think is no more to the mercy of god than in the sea a glade spark poverty he loves but it is honest hard-working poverty not the ostentatious professional poverty of the mendicants yet he is no precursor or forestaller of wycliffe and wycliffe's greatest work for he never attacks the doctrine of papacy but only its social and political abuses god amend the pope that pilleth holy church and claimeth by force to be king and keeper over christendom a striking contrast to this half mythical and impersonal Langlin was geoffrey chaucer the other and greater poet of the age passing his days in the thick of the interests the business and the pleasures of the world ambassador courtier traveller place hunter tried by all vicissitudes of fortune now living in splendour now hard pinched for his daily bread now in disgrace and in prison now again restored to royal favour he saw life in all its many-sided and many-hued variety and reproduced his impressions in undying colours in the picture gallery of the canterbury tales there is a tradition that chaucer foissart boccaccio and petrarch met together at milan at the marriage of prince lionel with the daughter of the great visconti be that as it may chaucer was familiar with the writings of the two italians and also with the vision of dante who had died some sixty years before our english poet wrote his great work and he was well acquainted with all the local and vernacular languages which were everywhere springing up in the languages derived from the romance latin he borrowed from the norman roman from the ancient classics from the popular legends but his real sympathy is with the spirit and genius of his own times and in those portions of his works which are of most enduring interest he drew upon his own varied experience for his materials thus though the canterbury tales first appeared some years after the death of edward the third they may be taken as illustrating the social life of the latter half of the fourteenth century and there is hardly one of its phases hardly an age or condition which chaucer has not fixed for ever in that comedy of manners in his power of creating a character at once the type of a class and a living breathing individual in the variety of his gifts in the pathos the humour the brightness the fancifulness the profusion of his genius he is second to one only of his countrymen and no unworthy precursor of the golden age of english poetry being indeed in the words of tennyson the first warbler whose sweet breath preluded those melodious bursts which fill the spacious times of great elizabeth with sounds that echo still as the plays of shakespeare are to the canterbury tales so is the prose of milton and bolingbroke to the rugged and half-formed but vigorous massive and pathetic language of wycliffe it might be hard to name two men more unlike in work character and circumstances than the contemporary fathers of english poetry and english prose but there is one point at which the two are in sympathy one ideal at least is common to them both the picture which chaucer has left us of the parish priest as he should be entitles the poet to claim spiritual kindred with the great reformer that portrait might have been drawn to the life from wycliffe himself not the stormy wycliffe of his early controversial days but the lowly subdued and tender pastor of the village flock of lutterworth End of section forty read by pamela nagami m d in encino california november twenty twenty two End of edward the third by william parsons warburton